Hello and welcome to the Justin Center Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jordan Cooper, and thank you so much once again for joining me on the program today. And as always, I want to give you a reminder that Justin Center as an organization is supported by donors. So if you would like to contribute to help out the organization and all of the things that we are doing here, go to justincenter.org, go to our donate page. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which means that any gifts that you do give to us are tax deductible. So we really do need your support. We really do appreciate it uh, when you are... Uh, able to help us out. Just two quick things I want to mention before I jump right into the topic today. Uh, the first of those, make sure you check out some of our new publications, especially check out our, our six-month devotional, which is uh, com- compiles portions of both Luther's small and large catechisms. You can go to justincenter.org and check that out along with our other publications. Also want to quickly mention, again, that we have a channel for the Widener Institute now. So W-E-I-D-N-E-R, Widener Institute. Check it out on YouTube. That's going to include all sorts of stuff from all of the fellows of the Widener Institute. So it's not just me. This is my personal channel, uh, which is part of Justin Center, but we have... We have far a far broader group of people working and writing and speaking on issues beyond just myself. So make sure you go subscribe there. All right. Now, we're going to be continuing today with our discussion of Patrick Deneen's Why Liberalism Failed. And we did part one of this that was released a couple weeks before this one. And in, in part one, we looked at some of the basic concepts that Deneen is working with and, and defining the issues of liberalism, uh, the, the some of the primary assumptions of liberalism, and then what some of the problems with some of those primary assumptions are. Now, I want, I, I've gotten a, a lot of response to that. Uh, appreciate the responses, mostly positive responses. Certainly some disagreement with Deneen's thesis and some of the comments that I made, which, you know, that's to be expected. And the purpose of these discussions is certainly to increase discussion <laughs> surrounding these these important points. And that's what I, what I always want to do. So, uh, the, the pushback and arguments against what I had said or what I laid out that Deneen was saying are, are helpful. That's, I think, part of what I want to do here is have these important conversations. So the pushback is, is good. It's very good. And I want to say this when we're talking about where Deneen is headed. And I know that a lot of people have commented things that have to do with things that Deneen has said outside of this particular book, which is this more positive construction of where he thinks we should go. And... I'm t- trying to take this book as it is without looking at it through the lens of the other things that Deneen has said. I will be getting into those after. So it's obviously an important part of a discussion of any thinker is, well, okay, we're looking at what problems they're seeing and then what's the solution that that they propose. But I want to say this, if we're, we can look at someone like Deneen's work with without agreeing with all of the conclusions it's going to come to and see that he brings up real issues. You don't have to be a, you don't have to completely reject all of the ideas in liberalism to recognize some of the issues that Deneen is really pointing out in liberalism and and specifically just ideas of the enlightenment and enlightenment views of freedom in general. So what I want to say is those of you who are, you know, adamantly proponents of, of liberalism and that Liberalism is also broad, so there are different forms of liberalism. That's part of this discussion is what falls under the banner of liberalism exactly. And we have to certainly talk talk about that as we're doing this. But but I want to say that even if you don't grab onto his rejection of liberalism as a whole, there are points that we can grab onto regardless. Some criticisms that I think everybody, especially from a Christian approach, which you know is my audience largely, so mostly, um, but, but not exclusively, actually. So, But from a Christian approach, there are things that I think are just kind of undeniably wrong or false in certain Enlightenment views of anthropology and what freedom means and just who we are as people, the, the function of the state, those kind of things. So just want to say that before we jump into the specifics here. Now, this uh, part of the this part of the talk here, we are now going to be delving into the kind of major, real major distinction that Deneen makes that's going to frame everything else that he says throughout this book. And that is that there are two distinctive views of liberty. There is a classical approach to what liberty means, and there then there is this enlightenment, post-enlightenment approach to what liberty means that is going to be adopted within liberalism. 
Now, to be clear, Enlightenment philosophers say a heck of a lot about liberty and freedom, and not all of them say the same thing. So we're generalizing a little bit here because I know that I always get the comments where somebody's like, but this Enlightenment thinker said something different. <laughs> we're talking in generalities here. That's the only way we can do things. Or we, if we nuance everything to death and, and you know, specify everybody that diverged in this or that, we would just never have a conversation because you'd never be able to get done. So, all right, just recognize that as we're going through this. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to read this section from, from the book here. It says, it's two revolutions. Um, it's anthropological individualism and the voluntarist conception of choice and its insistence on the human separation from and opposition to nature created its distinctive and new understanding of liberty as the most extensive possible expansion of the human sphere of autonomous activity. All right, there is a ton in that paragraph. I could spend the rest of the hour just unpacking everything that is said there. So let me just give you a little bit of an explanation of what's going on here. All right, so we're talking about the, the revolutions. Now, the Enlightenment era, especially with the, the time of the founding of the United States, is a kind of revolutionary era. We call it the American Revolution. We had the more radical French Revolution going on at the time. The Enlightenment in general certainly saw itself as a kind of liberation, a liberation from ideas of the Christian past that many thinkers believed to be mistaken or superstitious. There was an optimism about the use of reason and the conclusions that humanity was arriving at and, and a positive vision of the future of humanity. So these revolutionary ideas were very much tied together with liberalism. And some of that is just these are the, the things that are going on at the time. It's a kind of revolutionary time. All right. So he mentions two revolutions here ideologically. Now, some people also, I will say this because I get some responses to things that I'm talking about here. And I get these responses a lot to things that I, that I say when I'm talking about uh, the kind of genealogy of, of ideas, the history of ideas and how ideas affect one another, is that history and ideas and political movements, social movements, religious movements, all of those things are not simply the results of ideas, but that there are, are sociological factors there are scientific factors. There are all sorts of other things going on that influence the development of various movements, not just ideas. Because we as human beings are not simply, you know, brains who think logically and we always follow out the logical conclusion of all of our ideas. Not everybody's an academic. Academics don't control the world. The world is a heck of a lot more complicated than that. We as human beings are a heck of a lot more complicated than that. And let me just say, I recognize that's the case. And when I am doing these, you know, genealogy of ideas kind of studies, and I don't mean genealogy in, in the way that at least Foucault <laughs> means it, but when I'm looking at this question of like what idea comes here and what influences what, and this is a critique I've seen of Deneen too, so, and Truman as well. What I am not doing is saying that is the only factor involved in everything that's going on. But I'm not a sociologist. I am someone who reads theology and philosophy. So what, what, what can I contribute? <laughs> well, what I can contribute is how ideas affect each other. I'm not saying that's the entire picture of everything that happened. Of course it's not. But all of us can only speak in terms of the, the spheres that, that we are engaged in well. So that's, that's what I know. So that's what I'm doing. I'm just clarify because I've gotten a few comments like that. And I get those comments every time I do this kind of thing. So to clarify. Okay. But so here are some, uh, two of the ideas that Dinian points out that really are um, revolutionary. The first is what he calls the anthropological individualism. There is this there is this centering on the individual that occurs within modernity that in some ways comes from Christian roots, but goes beyond its Christian roots, I would say, in that Christianity is not collectivist. We believe that there is a value in each individual human person. And so in that way, when liberalism does speak about things like, like rights and individual human value, it is drawing on this Christian heritage. I will say that I, I, without Christian heritage, I don't think you get liberalism. There's a reason why it has arisen specifically in Christian nations. And there's a reason why when liberalism, people try to apply these forms of government in, you know, say, Islamic cultures, it doesn't work. Because that though those cultures have a different set of values and a different history. So there is something that arises out of Christianity in 
some of the fundamental principles of liberalism, particularly in that notion of the value of the individual, that we are not mere, you know, parts of, of some kind of collective. We're not the Borg, you know? So we, we have value as, as individual human beings. Uh, we, you know, we speak about humanity being created in the Imago Dei or in the, in the image of God with inherent dignity. So that is, is a Christian conviction, but with with liberalism and the rise of, of modernity more generally, there there is a move away from un the understanding of humanity as we have significant value as individuals, but we are not just individuals, but we are also parts of communities and that those communities are an essential part of our identity as well. So there has to be this balance between individual value and also recognizing the centrality of culture and community and traditions that we find ourselves in. And what happens here is that there is this isolation of the individual. There's a grabbing on to that principle of the value of the individual to such an extent that the individual becomes isolated above and even against the community into which that individual has, uh, has been born or brought into life into. And in some ways, this can, we can say that this goes back to Descartes, and we have a long history to talk about that. But uh, just one point to clarify regarding Descartes. If you want to see some of this in The Birth of Modern Philosophy in Descartes, you could check out my video on, on Descartes. I have a two-part series on Descartes and the Birth of, of Modernity, if you want to check those out in the Makers of the Modern World series. But Descartes, when he is thinking through how it is that humanity comes to a knowledge of anything at all. He begins with the self. This is the very famous phrase, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Knowledge starts with knowledge of the existence of the self. There is a kind of inward turn that happens with Descartes. Now, I'm not saying Descartes is a total individualist, but there are some ideas that kind of spawn off of Descartes then that lead to this kind of hyper-individualism. So we have this, uh, this anthropological individualism, this viewing ourselves as these just isolated, free creatures, divorced from our communities that happens. And then we have what he mentions as the voluntarist conception of choice. Voluntarism, this comes from the Latin word for will. And voluntarism is something that really arises first in theology in some of the medieval nominalists in the way that they're talking about God. So there's this broader question of why is it that the things are morally good are, are morally good? Are things morally good because they reflect God's nature? Or are things morally good because God decides that they are morally good? In other words, he could have decided something totally different. So the classic example of this is, is lying. This is the one that William of Ockham uses. So does God simply, is lying wrong because God does not lie or is lying wrong because God decided that lying was bad and God could have decided otherwise? Now, this voluntarist approach to God is the one that said God, God basically chooses what is morally right and morally wrong. And there is then from this voluntarism that happens within theology, an increased emphasis on the nature of the will as free choice, something that is, that is unhindered by things outside of itself. So that's largely what we're talking about with voluntarism. It starts in some ways, as I said, with, with uh, theology. There's some things in Renaissance humanism in, in terms of the way they, they view humanity that could possibly lead towards something like this. But then it develops further within, within liberalism. So there is then this, uh, this, this voluntarism that, that happens. And it says, in its insistence on the human separation from and opposition to nature, created its distinctive new understanding of liberty. So there is this human separation from nature. This is something that does happen technologically as well as it does ideologically. We talked about this a bit in, in our discussion of Truman's book, that when as soon as people start to gain a much broader scientific understanding of the world, the world seems more controllable. When... You know, think, for example, about farming. Okay, agriculture is probably the most obvious example of this. 
when you look at agriculture in an ancient society, you can't just, you know, if you, if you have a bad year, you're in a drought, you can't just ship food from somewhere else. It's not that easy. And so if you don't have good weather, you don't grow crops and you can't eat. You know, with globalization, even if we're you know, having terrible crops, yet prices may raise a lot, but you can still ship things from all over the place because there's global trade. And while things are bad in one part of the world, they're not always going to be bad in, in other parts of the world weather-wise. So it's very different. But in an ancient community, agriculturally, you're kind of at the whims of nature. You don't feel like you can control nature. You just kind of are stuck with what nature gives you, right? So this is especially true with traveling, I mean, traveling the oceans. This is why the the ocean is, this is both true and certainly true in scripture, but it's also true within Greek mythology is the ocean is, is a terrifying place because it's this vast open place that you, you get a little boat and you, you hope to make it to wherever you're going. But hey, if the weather gets bad enough or something happens, then you're, you're lost, right? The ocean is the, a picture of this vastness of the power of nature over us. And, and to some extent, the ocean is still like that because of its nature of being unexplored. But we can now manipulate technology to make a plane to just fly over the ocean. We can just fly from one continent to another. We don't even have to get in a boat at all. We can just you know, hop right over it because technology is developed. So the more that technology develops, the more that we start to see ourselves not as beholden to nature, but over and above nature. We're something totally other than creation, and we can manipulate creation. This is really a distortion of what we see in the book of Genesis, that Adam is given this cultural mandate, this creation mandate, that we are called to take care of the earth. We are called to mirror God or image God in our own kind of sovereignty over the earth. But that is not to be done in a manipulative way. It is to be done in a it's a sense of stewardship, not I am God over the earth, but but God has given humanity a uniqueness that we can indeed steward and care for creation. So there's a difference between caring for creation and then viewing ourselves as, as these kind of gods above creation. So this rise of the understanding of humanity and opposition between humanity and creation occurs at the Enlightenment and also coincides with increased skepticism, increased skepticism toward traditional religious convictions. So there is an increased emphasis on the liberty of humanity and a decreased emphasis on, on God and God's sovereignty and power. So we see this with someone like Immanuel Kant, and again, I have a video on Immanuel Kant, that Kant, in his view of the humanity as subject and the relationship between subject and object, the relationship between us and the world that we inhabit, there is a kind of sense in Kant of us over above the things around us, totally distinct as rational, free beings. And there is this increased emphasis on both rationality and freedom, and there's this intimate connection between rationality and freedom, so that to be the most free is to be the most rational, and to be the most rational is to be the most free. So these emphases on human or autonomous rationality and freedom very much go, go together. So I know that's a lot of background for this small paragraph, but I think it's essential to understand all of that that's going on philosophically and technologically and culturally and everything else in order to understand why it is all of a sudden that liberty takes on this very different form. So when we're thinking of liberty in a post-enlightenment context, we're thinking about the liberty to control things, freedom to do whatever it is that we desire to do, freedom to manipulate nature in whatever way that we want. This idea that we are not really beholden to nature. There is nothing that is per se natural or unnatural. Something that's natural is something whatever you can actually do. So it doesn't matter what something naturally does. As long as it's possible for us to do it, then it's, it's good enough. And we certainly see this with things like the gender reassignment surgeries that are going on today. It's a fantastic and probably the clearest example of this, this kind of mindset of complete and total control over nature. That We think that we can take the most basic element of us as created beings, which is God created us male and female, 
and we can manipulate that. We can take that and and distort it so that we're not even beholden to what are the most basic categories that we are created to be. And this ultimate act of of self liberation, liberation from the constraints of nature. Well. Then let's see how he explains this further. He says, Liberalism rejects the ancient conception of liberty as the learned capacity of human beings to conquer the slavish pursuit of base and hedonistic desires. So this is what we talked about a bit last time as well, that in a classical approach to freedom or or liberty, and if you read someone like St. Augustine, you have this very deeply within the Christian tradition that there's an understanding that liberty is really f- being able to make choices that are opposed to those base desires, not being beholden to our selfishness, not being beholden to uh, simply the, the animal desires that we have, that are, are, are our appetites. And, you know, the Greeks talked about these different kinds of souls. We have the, the appetitive soul so that we have these, these kind of base appetites and those base appetites are like, okay, you get hungry, so you eat. You need to sleep, so you sleep. You, you want sex, so you have sex. You, there are these natural things that a human body desires, and your, your base, those are your base desires, your, your most uh, kind of physical desires. They're not, they're not rational desires per se. And within an ancient Greek conception of liberty, which again, this is adopted by, by early Christians as well, even if it takes some you know, different, different forms, and if we're talking about specific moral, moral claims or ethical norms, um, but is that these, these appetites need to be governed by reason, right? So that if, if I, this is why we call somebody a glutton, if they are simply beholden to that desire to eat. So if you just are really hungry and every time you're hungry, you grab food or you order a pizza or do whatever, that that makes you a glutton, right? Or if you have a desire to just bum around because you have this natural desire to, to sleep and you're tired, if you just give in to that desire at all times without any resistance to it, this could be the sin of sloth, right? You're you're lazy, you just bum around, you don't fight against that, that internal desire. You say, well, I'm tired, I don't feel like doing anything, so I'm simply not going to do anything today. <laughs> uh, and you can talk about this with any kind of addiction or lust, that it is the giving in to those base desires, those appetites, that really constitutes sin. And, and sin, of course, being a Christian concept, but within the Greeks, they, they talk you know, similarly that reason has this functional role that it's not, reason is not purely autonomous, right? Reason is not just something that I use to do whatever I want, but reason is something that I can use to regulate my desires and make choices between my desires. So if, say my, you know, say if my kids have to go to school in the morning and I've got to give my kids a ride to school and I wake up and I am just really stinking tired because I didn't sleep well that night, I have a couple options. I could just stay in bed and say, whatever, I don't care if my kids go to school today because I'm tired and I feel like doing that. <laughs> or I could get my butt out of bed and go take my kids to school. So which of those options is the right option? Well, of course, the getting up and taking my kids to school is the right option. Well, how did I not give in to my, my base appetites by wanting to sleep and just not sleeping? Well, I use my brain, right? This is what rationality is for. So I use my rationality to, to help to govern my desires. So I look at my desire for the well-being of my kids and they're getting an education. And then on the other hand, I look at my desire to keep sleeping. And while at the time, my desire to keep sleeping may be a little more powerful than that desire to give my kids an education and, bring, and get them to school, with my rational mind, I can, I can categorize those things and say, okay, well, this is actually more important than this. So I'm going to, despite the fact that I have this strong desire to sleep, I'm going to set that aside so that I can make the right decision. That's the role of reason and its relationship to our appetites, as it should be. So reason helps to properly order our desires. 
And true liberty, then, for the Greeks, is a liberty from our base desires. It is having the freedom to say no when we desire things. You see that this is very different from how especially society today, and it's not that this has always been the case, but especially today, freedom is, it is mere consent, right? This, this, is, this has become the new ethical norm that as long as an individual consents to something, that is the only possible thing that really matters, right? Who cares about anything else? As long as you have consented to X, Y, or Z, then that thing is, is totally fine and good. Um, there is certainly a lot more than consent to making ethical ethical decisions or determinations about what is moral and what is immoral. But that demonstrates that that focus on consent demonstrates, I think, very well this shift in the way that we view liberty. So we're thinking of liberty merely as not being constrained. Whereas for the Greeks, liberty is really freedom to control yourself, to have some kind of, of self-control. So I'll, I'll read this further here. He says, this kind of liberty is a, con and this is classical sense of liberty, is a condition of self-governance of both city and soul drawing closely together the individual cultivation and practice of virtue in the shared activities of self-legislation. Now there is this emphasis on community, on shared activities. When we speak about virtue in the classical world, as well as in the Christian West prior to recent years, Virtue is a matter of the individual, certainly. So we, we talk about the cultivation of virtue within an individual's character, but there also is a sense of social virtue. Societies can be virtuous societies. I hear this a lot from, I think, well-meaning Christians when they say we can't have a Christian government, we can't have Christian music, we can't have Christian anything, we can only have Christian people because Christianity is a matter of the heart and a matter of conversion. That manner of thinking is very much an enlightenment idea. It, it's not something that people in the past would have thought of because we don't think of ourselves and shouldn't think of ourselves as merely separated individuals. When you say something is a, say, a Christian country, if, if we're talking about a certain nation, and I'm not going to get into debates about the United States or whatever, but it just if you call a country a Christian country or a Muslim country or a Hindu country or a Jewish country, does that mean, are you saying that every single individual in that nation is a devout believer in whatever that religion may be that you have identified? Of course not. Because that's not all a nation is. A nation is more than just a collection of distinct individuals. So that nations can have a character. Nations can have shared values. So to talk about, say, a Christian nation is not to say everyone in a nation is a Christian, but to say that the basic assumptions and values and inheritance that that culture has is a Christian one. To argue otherwise that it has to be just individuals, is to completely divorce the individual from society. And then you, you end up with what Thomas Paine does, where basically he says, well, we're all just individuals. We're, we don't have any inheritance. We're not part of any real broader community at all. So we should basically just rewrite our constitution every generation because, well, I didn't agree to whatever my grandfather did, so who cares? We're, we're a bunch of isolated individuals and we could just kind of keep changing things as much as we want. And then that, that leads to just complete and utter disaster. I'm going to do a program on Thomas Paine too. So uh, be on the lookout for that. <laughs> so, but because I think he's he's pretty key in a lot of these ideas. And I think he shows the more, most extreme form of this social contract type of liberalism. So we're talking not just in the ancients about the individual and we're talking about virtue, but there is a sense of social virtue. There are values that a given society holds to be right and to be wrong. And there is something to actual social character, and there has to be. There's no such thing as a nation without any kind of shared values at all. It simply will not function. All right. And liberalism often tries to have that, which is what the problem is. But we will, what we will see is that if you're looking at the classical liberal authors, 
it's true that people like, especially John Locke is, is a good example of this. There are many who are very clear that there still have to be some shared Christian values in order for this to actually work. But others really move away from that. I think, again, Thomas Paine, I think, is the best example of that. And, and today people are trying to very much move away from any shared concept of the good at all. And in some ways, I think that's kind of the inevitable result of some of these ideas. Uh, but it's something that we're, we're dealing with right now. All right. So then uh, we see this final paragraph here. Liberalism instead understands liberty as the condition in which one can act freely within the sphere of unconstrained is the sphere unconstrained by positive law. So freedom basically is lack of constraint. You can do whatever you feel like doing. Everyone can do whatever he pleases. That is how we understand, often understand freedom in this context of, of liberalism. Okay, so let's talk about liberal voluntarism real quick here. This is a, a picture of Thomas Hobbes. And again, I'm going to be doing a whole program on Thomas Hobbes and his ideas here, but he, but Deneen says this, the first revolution and the most basic and distinctive aspect of liberalism is to base politics upon the idea of voluntarism, the unfettered and autonomous choice of individuals. And this, you know, he, he cites Hobbes as really the foundation of this. Hobbes actually isn't quite the first. He's often cited as the first, but, but he's the most influential to do this in that this is really the beginning of these discussions about rights and human rights being at the center of how we view government. Now, Thomas Hobbes' book Leviathan, and I mentioned it a little last time, just quick overview here. It's very big, so there's a lot to it. And Thomas Hobbes actually has a pretty interesting philosophy outside of his political philosophy. He wrote a lot more than just Leviathan, and his other work is, is really worth taking a look at, at least. But his book, Leviathan, essentially he makes the argument that in a state of nature, we're all, we're all selfish and we take what we want. We are basically by nature not part of community. Community is something that's forced. So for Hobbes, we are by nature individuals. And in this state of nature, life is nasty, brutish, in short. We are, we're horrible to each other. We treat each other terribly. We would just kill and take what we want. And so then because of that state of nature being as bad as it is, we make the free decision as human persons to then come together and create some form of government in order to make life a little better. And so the basis of government then is not in some kind of transcendent order, some kind of sacred order, but the basis of government is really the choice of those individuals. So it is, it is a contract between individuals coming together to secure some kind of right, which really for Hobbes, he doesn't have a long list of rights. He's really talking about the right to life, and that's literally it for, for Hobbes. And Hobbes' solution is to get this extremely powerful monarch who basically tells everybody what to do because, it, and he's just there to make sure that everybody's life is protected, but because we're all so terrible, we need this basic like monster, this Leviathan to keep us in order. Um, so that's that's the approach of, of Hobbes. Now Hobbes' views don't, a lot of his views are not that influential later on, but really it is this notion that government is, does not come from sacred order, that government instead arises from a, a free contract or decision from individuals in their state as pure individuals to create a community. So in a way, community then is not the natural state of humanity, but it's something that individuals chose to do. So this is a very radical break with what has been the case in the past. Now, um, I have a, a quote here from uh, Fukuyama. This is, well, I guess maybe it's not actually a quote, but there's a citation of Fukuyama here. Uh, he has a book called The End of History. He says, Liberalism's victory was declared to be unqualified and complete in 1989 in the seminal article, The End of History. Sorry, article, not book. Um, by Francis Fukuyama, written following the collapse of the last competing ideological opponent. Fukuyama held that liberalism had proved itself the sole legitimate regime on the basis that it had withstood all challengers and defeated all competitors, and further, that it worked because it accorded with human nature. So there is this, and that's very much true in the 80s and 90s. I don't think that's as true today as it once was. 
that, that people are thinking this way. So there is, and in the Reagan years, people were very optimistic about the United States. It's true in the Clinton years in the 90s as well. And there was, for many, this hope and belief that liberalism, democracy, was really the only valid form of government. It made the most sense with human nature, and that eventually we would really be able to establish these democratic governments all over the world, and we would have some kind of peace. This is what humanity always tries to do. We talked about World War I as the war to end all wars. Obviously, that didn't happen. <laughs> this is something that we see throughout history, that there are these very optimistic, utopian kind of ideas. And anytime you see that, certainly from a Christian perspective, you know it's wrong. <laughs> the, the people are selfish and sinful and there is no system that is going to be a perfect governmental system. And I think that's that's pretty clear. So some people ask, well, Christians, should we have, you know, as Christians, should we have a specific form of government? Is there a is there a form of government that scripture requires? Is monarchy the best form of government? Is and to some degree we have to say, I think, that all societies are deeply flawed. All governments are deeply flawed. Anytime you get anybody in positions of power, those people are going to be corrupt. However, you can't have nobody in a position of power because that just leads to complete chaos. So there, there's a just recognition, and I think a realism, just being realistic about the fact that these utopian scenarios simply are not going to happen. So we have to work with whatever we've got. We work with the best we've got to preserve peace in the best way that we possibly can in the time that, that we are living in within each of our own cultures. So this has, I think, shown itself to be less viable this idea of liberalism as really this this kind of end goal of history that everything is leading toward liberal democracy as being the you know ultimate form of government and that is be really because of the excessive involvement in regime change in in the middle east and it, within the 2000s so following 911 our involvement in iraq afghanistan had those experiments that Americans engaged in, and I'm not going to get into motivations or anything like that. And, and I, like I said, I try not to be political, but um, like, but to politically partisan, I mean. Um, but to some extent, you kind of have to talk about this as the groundwork for what we're talking about here. So, there, the optimism is not there in the same way because we saw that Islamic cultures don't have the same values as the Western cultures that we are living in. And therefore, the forms of government that we have are simply not going to make sense in those cultures. Their values are different. Their history is different. So if we're talking about the rituals, tradition, inheritance, history of any particular people, the governments that may work in one area at one time may not work somewhere else. So any idea, I think, that we have that there is some kind of perfect form of government that we can just implement everywhere everything's going to be great whether it's you know the marxists did this certainly in the past and you know the enlightenment certainly believed this so there, there are all different times and places where people do this but i think we need to just kind of give up on these ideas altogether all right so here's something that is a, a really major issue with within liberalism and that is the total loss of, of social bonds and he says, perhaps, uh, Dean says, perhaps above all, liberalism is drawn down on a pre-liberal inheritance and resources that at once sustain liberalism, but which it cannot replenish. The loosening of social bonds in nearly every aspect of life, familial, neighborly, communal, religious, even national, reflects the advancing logic of liberalism and is the source of its deepest instability. And I think that there is a lot of truth to this in that the reason why liberal democracy, say in the United States, has worked as well as it has is really that pre-liberal inheritance is because we have we have inherited that Christian assumptions. You know, you get to the question, is America, was it founded as a Christian nation? Uh, and 
there's kind of a yes and no to that, I think. Was it founded in, in the, as a Christian nation in the sense that, you know, all the founding fathers were Orthodox Christians? I mean, anybody familiar with the Enlightenment knows that that's not the case at all. Most of them would have been considered heretics. <laughs> like, at the, like they, they were. I mean, that's that's the reality. You've got a you know, few that are Orthodox. So are we talking about some kind of, you know, utopian Christian ideal past in the United States? Not, not in the slightest. But is there another sense in which the United States was a Christian nation. Well, if you're taught what you're talking about is the general values, outlook on life, uh, way that people are viewed, yes, those things were inherited from Christianity in many ways. So, with that kind of Christian inheritance, the Christian ideas that were were there, liberalism seemed to work decently well. That doesn't mean that those principles were all always followed well. Okay, it doesn't mean they were always followed consistently, but they were there. <laughs> so, uh, not, uh, for example, I'm not, uh, you know, validating, you know, chattel slavery as it, as it existed in the early United States, but I think that was a, a significant departure from what were those Christian values, not a kind of logical conclusion of them. Uh, but that doesn't make sense with liberal values either. So even this autonomous individualism kind of wouldn't make any sense with that either. But um, I don't know if there's more to that than simply selfishness. So what happens, though, is that when there is this shared, general shared cultural values, and you see this within religious institutions in any given society, the United States is a bit odd in that way because we didn't have any formalized ones, but we think of the mainline churches. There, and, and we had also, we had different community groups that people used to be a part of, but once that disappears, this is where liberalism really shows its significant weaknesses because it doesn't have mechanisms to rein, re, really reinforce communal ideas in, in any significant way. So this is the issue that we're facing sociologically right now is that we have this total isolation that most people are feeling. My wife recently wrote an article for the Christian Research Institute on, on loneliness. You can look that up. Maybe I'll try to remember to put a link to that below. But that deals with some of the just statistics of the loneliness that people feel in our society today. And the United States is not doing well. The whole Western world is not doing well in this regard. But, but especially the U.S. is very much... I'm not doing well because we are losing all of those social bonds and and we are we're more and more isolated and this is causing significant distress it's in many ways I think this is what is leading toward the rise of the kind of gender ideology that we see especially with young women today not just women but it, I see it more so with women that when you lose sense of community you have to find other ways to make community and when there is no sense of real cultural bonding, you make your sub, you make subcultures. I've, I've talked about this a bit before that I was very much involved in the punk rock and straight edge uh, subcultures when I was when I was younger. And it's really because I just wanted a community, right? And you have these shared rituals that you develop together when you go to shows and you have shared music and things to talk about. Humans are created to be communal, so when we are isolated individuals, we're going to create our own groups. So if if traditional forms or traditional institutions, traditional uh, forms of, of etiquette and dress or whatever it might be, when those things disappear, people are then going to just create their own thing. And this is especially true with, with teenagers. We've just kind of accepted this idea that, well, teenagers rebel and they form their own groups and they believe and do crazy things. It's not like you find that everywhere in history. That is a pretty unique phenomenon, and that's pretty modern. To some extent, yeah, of course, there's going to be, you know, hormones going on. So there's some rebellion and things that go along with that. But the kind of expected rebellion against all of society that occurs in your teenage years, that is not as normal as Americans tend to think that it is. And I think it is a loss of this inheritance, a loss of this tradition that has forced people in the midst of those difficult, hormonal, weird years <laughs> to kind of create their own thing and create their own meaning in their own communities. So that's, that's what's going on today.
All right, liberation from associations. Let's see, he says this. Ironically, the more completely the sphere of autonomy is secured, the more comprehensive the state must become. And so this is part of his, his political argument, is le at least, is that what he's going to argue is that as what we think, when we think of liberalism, we tend to think of small government. However, he's going to say that government actually increases in order to defend individual liberties. So it, it creates all of these other structures that are necessary to make sure that everybody can be actually really autonomous. So liberty as defined requires liberation from all forms of associations and relationships, from family to church, from schools to village and community that exerted control over behavior through informal and habitual expectations and, and norms. So in this approach to liberty, really we, we have to be, we're kind of skeptical of, of associations. And I don't think this is true of all forms of liberalism, but when you look at someone like Rousseau, it is very true. Rousseau tends to view the civilization as a kind of, uh, a, an impediment to people being who they really are. Okay, so there's this idea that there is a kind of real authentic self and that authentic self is buried within society because society has all of these varied expectations that stop you from really being that authentic self. And in some ways then to be your authentic self, the best thing you can do is cut yourself off from society because then you can really be who you are who you really are. And the, the idea is that there is some kind of internal self that's divorced from your community, that's divorced from your religious commitments, from the place where you live, from your family, from the whatever role you play within your, your school or your job or whatever else it might be. That there really is some just isolated individual self that needs to be found. I need to find myself, as we often say. There are plenty of places where you see this. Rousseau is probably the most clear, but this is true about the transcendentalists. You, know, you get this. I'm not a fan of Emerson of Thoreau at all. Uh, I know some people may not like me for that. I'm sorry, but they, you know, there is this kind of whimsical idea of like going off into the woods and escaping society, and you find out what's really beautiful and who you really are. And I, I think it's. I just think it's a mistaken way of looking at the world. And we see this in all sorts of ways. A great example of this is is poetry. My, you know, my wife is the one who's who's the poet. She writes and reads all about poetry. And but this is, I think, that's a place where some of these societal shifts become cr pretty obvious. So if you look at like classical poetry, there are specific forms. Okay, you've got certain forms that you follow. There are inherited forms that you follow. There is certainly a place to diverge from those forms at times, but to do so intentionally and creatively. That's a very different thing than just not knowing what they are. <laughs> so, but when you, when you look at older poetry, people are, they're viewing the forms as things that have been inherited, right? So you're seeing yourself as part of this broader tradition of poets. You're part of, you know, Western, and we're talking Western here, but you could totally be part of whatever, you know, poetic or cultural tradition you're a part of. There are many of them throughout the world, but specifically thinking here about, you know, the kind of Anglo poetry. So you're, you're part of the, you know, Western European American tradition. And so you see yourself as part of that tradition and you are going to work within those restraints to some degree. Again, poetry has to be creative. So it's okay to like go outside of them some, but you still have the roots there, right? You've got the foundation, you know how those things work. And when you look at poetry that is popular now it's kind of it's free verse which means there are no constraints at all you just write whatever the heck you feel like and it is ultimately only about feeling of course poetry is supposed to convey feeling it's a significant part of poetry but now it's only feeling there's nothing else as long as as long as it only evokes certain internal emotions that's the only thing that matters because it's an expression of your individual self and your individual feelings and that's it instead of recognizing oh, I can use these kind of classical forms and I can express myself in my feelings, but also do so within this tradition of this community that I'm a part of and the things that I have inherited. And so this is how you get the kind of rupee cowers and insta-poetry 
So we see this, this freedom from association, this freedom from or liberation from tradition all over the place. And you can look at this really in, in you see it especially in the arts, but you see it in all sorts of other fields as well. I, I say this with modern art also, and I, I may be odd in this way because I, uh, most conservatives, you know, most more conservative minded people are, are very opposed to modern art. I actually love early modern art. I think it's great. I don't like contemporary art. Modern art and contemporary art are totally different things. And it drives me crazy when people associate meaningless art with modern art. And modern art also has a ton of movements and you could, you know, talk about all the different things that make up modern art. But what what I think differentiates early modern art from then you know, what happened, especially mid 20th century and then moving into contemporary art is, was modern art always a bit rebellious? Yeah, for sure. But there is still a, a connection to the previous art because modern art's reacting against something and it's making statements about something and it's it's taking those forms and and changing them or doing something different with them. So what it's once you get rid of that inheritance altogether, so it's kind of a progression really. Because I mean someone like Van Gogh or Monet, they're modern art, um, which you know people get certainly don't when they're complaining about modern art that's not usually what they're thinking of but that is modern art it was very experimental it was very different at the time but of course they're still working within the tradition of what they've received and they're changing it and they're doing interesting things with it but then once you get to the point that you've now totally diverged from anything that is historic there's nothing even interesting about it <laughs> so it's just not good because the, the best things are not created by isolated individuals. The best things are done in conversation and, and in things that have been, been received. All right. Um, liberalism homogenizes. And this is something that we're certainly seeing today that when you know people talk all about diversity or multiculturalism, and while this may you know, seem to be something that is good to a lot of people. Certainly it's celebrated in our culture. What what the assumption might be is, well, this is the opposite of homogeneity because this, the whole point of diversity is you get people from, who are very different and cultures that are all very different. But that is simply not what actually happens. What you get is people that maybe look different, but all have the same very clearly progressive liberal values, you know? So, so there is no sense of actual ideological diversity. There is one ideology. Diversity is merely this smokescreen for we're all progressive liberals, but we look different. That's not diversity. Diversity is actual difference in cultures and values and ways of thinking and, and thoughts. And, and that's what a, a real multiculturalism would, would be. Um, so what he's saying is liberalism actually leads to this kind of homogenizing, which it supposedly doesn't do. And in doing that, liberalism and the values of liberalism itself end up basically taking the place of what would be traditional religious values. And, you know, I've made this point a bunch of times for a number of years and different videos at this point, and not like that's original with me, right? So so I've said that the, the kind of canceling we have in our culture today is is really just a kind of modern progressive form of excommunication in that we always have, everyone has value systems, every community has value systems. And when you have a value system, you have ways of, of punishing in some way or exiling or, or in some way marginalizing those who differ from that, whatever that value system is. We all do that. You can't avoid doing that. Society has to have ways of regulating what people do. Okay, that's just, and that happens whether it's law or just social stigma, it happens. You know, you've got prisons, that's why they exist. But more than just that, you know, we've got within, you know, you have excommunication, you have boundaries around what can be, what's acceptable behavior and, and what's not. You have things in your job that if you engage in certain behaviors, you get fired and you should get fired. So it's inevitable that in a, a post-religious culture that there are going to be new forms of excommunication. So this takes the form of, of kind of canceling as we've seen today. And 
And to be clear, there are some of those people that have been, you know, canceled that actually were insanely abusive and should have been too. <laughs> so I, I know everybody talks about cancel culture and it absolutely is, it exists. And it absolutely is the case that to be canceled in many ways is simply to diverge ideologically from what is this progressive liberal homogeneity. But there are other people that within a, a strongly religious conservative society would also have been excommunicated or exiled. <laughs> so, so just because someone is canceled doesn't make them um, valid, right? That, does, that doesn't mean that it's that it's invalid. So, if you look at, and I'm trying to, you know, think like think of like Keith Raniere, right? The the founder of Nexium, cult leader who abused tons of women and was just a generally just horrendous narcissistic sociopathic person you know he's he's now well i guess he can't do anything really online but he has a group of, of people that support him online and they all say talk about cancel culture well okay no he was an abusive cult leader and is going to be in prison for the rest of his life and should be in prison for the rest of his life so so it doesn't doesn't make it doesn't make you virtuous just because you're canceled <laughs> um but 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 many of the people that have been it really is just because they, they have not uh, adopted the whatever ideology is popular progressivism today. So that's something that's, that I think Deneen gets right, certainly here in looking at the homogeneity that comes from, uh, from liberalism. Um, oh man, now we're I'm looking at all of this stuff here. I've got too much to talk about. I may stop here because I know that once I get into this next point, um, yeah, there, there's going to be too much that, that I want to say. I think we're not we're not quite at an hour yet, but I think we're at a pretty good place. So I uh, hope you found this helpful. I know this is a bit of a different discussion maybe than some other things that I've done, but I really like to do these cultural deep dives. I really enjoy it. I know some of you really enjoy it. Some of you don't enjoy it. And again, that's fine. You don't have to listen to these. If you just want the more theological things, I put those out a lot. It's it's now I, I'm tr what I'm trying to do in, in my content at this point is really balance this especially in terms of the weekly podcasts so i what i what i'm not going to be doing is doing like these kind of cultural issues or takes every week or you know for two months straight and i did do this in the past but i'm trying to space it out so that i've no matter what i do at least every other week is is a more strictly theological program um, so thanks so much for listening and or watching, and we will see you in the next one. God bless.